to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor and the broken hearted new life. And for those who mourn, heaven's child is born. This is the gospel of Christ. An evil king asked a great question. Is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37 verse 17. As we think today about God's truth and how it's been revealed to us and what it teaches, we need to understand God has spoken. There is word from God and that word is found for us in the Bible. Paul repeated a similar question in Romans chapter 4 and verse 3 when he asked, What does the scripture say? What does the Bible say? Has God revealed himself to us? Has he revealed his will to us? If so, where is that will? And what does it teach us about how to live and how to do the things that God wants us to do? First, let's realize that God has revealed himself to each and every one of us. I want you to notice Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The scripture says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Here God clearly teaches us that although he used to speak in various ways through the prophets, through angels, God spoke directly out of the cloud at times, now... How does God speak to men and women today? It, does God whisper in their ear? Does God send them some inner feeling? How does God speak to us today? Notice again, God has in these last days, the Christian era, spoken to us by His Son. If men and women are going to hear the voice of God today, if they are going to obey His will, it will be done by listening to and doing what Jesus Christ teaches us. Here's what's great about the Word of God. We have that Word and it's everything we need to get to heaven. I love the words of 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 and 17. Paul said, all Scripture, not, not some, not a few, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is God breathed and profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, listen, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. This book, the Word of God, is God's message to us today. God has spoken and it gives us everything we need to get to heaven. Peter said in 2 Peter 1 verses 19 through 21, the holy men of God spoke as they were moved or guided by the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what it'd be like without the Word of God? It'd be like trying to navigate through a dark room. It'd be like trying to make it through this life without the sunlight to give us light. You know, that reminds me of Psalm 119, verse 105. Look at what the psalmist said about God's Word. The psalmist said, Your Word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. It gives us direction, it keeps us from stumbling, and ultimately it shines the light on the way to heaven itself. And so, has God spoken? Absolutely, God has spoken to each and every one of us today. But then as we think about the idea of God speaking to us, and is there any word from the Lord, we ask next, where is that word? How do we find God's message for us today? Many people become confused when we talk about understanding the Bible, understanding where God's law is for us today, and sometimes they'll go back even as far as the Ten Commandments and say, we need to live under the Mosaic Law, we need to live under the Ten Commandments, we need to do the things that they there did and live like them. As you look to the Bible, God's revealed will, it tells us 
we've got to rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15. We need to understand today that God's revealed will for us is in the New Testament. When we ask the question, is there any word from the Lord? The answer is a resounding yes. But we ask then, where is that? And it's in the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to notice the words of John chapter 1 and verse 17. Look at what Jesus here said. Jesus said, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth are where? Are in Christ. That, that grace that brings salvation down. Titus 2 verses 11 through 13. That grace that makes salvation possible. Ephesians 2 verse 8. That grace that calls God to send His Son from heaven and come and live a, a, a human life and die a perfect sacrifice. That grace is in Christ. And truth is in Christ. And we'll notice in just a minute that's important because it's the truth that will set us free. John chapter 8 and verse 32. But notice, grace and truth are not in Moses. They're in Christ. Today, we have the New Testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have the better covenant. Hebrews 8 verses 5 through 6. We have the covenant under which there is immediate forgiveness of sins when one obeys it. Do you remember Hebrews 10 verses 3 through 5? The Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. Think about this, friend. Why would you want to go back to a law that couldn't take away sin anyway? At its best, there was a reminder of sin. Would you want to go to a law that reminded you of your sin? A law that even when you made the bloodiest sacrifice you could imagine didn't take it away? That's the old law. And friend, thank God that we're living under the sunshine age and the sunshine age of Christianity. We have that better covenant. Now, sometimes people struggle with the idea of the old covenant being removed and us being under the new covenant. But the Bible does make it abundantly clear. Hebrews 8 and verse 13, the apostle or the Hebrew writer said that the old law was growing old and ready to vanish away. It had become obsolete no longer useful for the people in the New Testament. And then, of course, we think of the words of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Jesus, at his death, nailed the old law, the handwriting of requirements, to the cross. It's no longer a viable law for each and every one of us today. In fact, Jesus himself taught us that when we stand before the judgment seat of God, when I stand before God to give an account of my life, when you stand before God to give an account of your life, we'll be judged by the words of Jesus, not the words of Moses. Look at what Jesus said in John 12 and verse 48. Notice these words. Jesus said, He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him, the word that I've spoken, will judge him in the last day. On that final day, when men's lives are opened up, when the books are opened, what's, what, what's our judge going to be? It's going to be the words of Jesus Christ, not the words of Moses. Well, if God has spoken, and if then that law for us today is the New Testament, do we have all of it? Some people say, well, we've got bits and pieces and we need a little more here and a little more there and maybe we need another revelation. Do we have everything we need today to get to heaven? Friend, the answer to that is very clear also. God has not only spoken and not only do we have the new law of Jesus Christ, but we have everything we need to get to heaven and live the best life. You know, Jesus made this promise to his apostles, to his disciples while he was alive. He promised they would receive everything necessary to get men and women to heaven. Look at John chapter 16 and notice this promise that Jesus made in John 16 verse 13. Jesus said, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. How much truth did Jesus say the disciples were going to get? Can't get more than all. 
And that's what God promised us today. Friend, in the pages of the New Testament, I've got everything I need to get to heaven. I love the words of 2 Peter 1 verse 3. The scripture says, according to his divine knowledge, God has given to us all things that pertain to life and godless. Not only has God given me everything I need, but he's given it for two areas. God has given us all things for life. Friend, if you obey the gospel and live the Christian life, you are the most well-equipped person for this life right now. John 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I came that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. There's no better life in the here and now than the Christian life. But then notice that second part. I have all things for life and godliness. In the New Testament, I've got everything I need to be the godly person God wants me to be, to change my life and to live in such a way that I can be guaranteed heaven will be my home. Don't you love the words of Jesus in John chapter 8 and verse 32? Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. But what is that truth? Jesus stated later in John 17 verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. This book is truth. It's all truth. And the promise to each one of us is if we obey it, if we do what it says, we can live with God forever. Is there any word from the Lord? Absolutely. I've got everything I need and so do you to be the godly person that we need to be. I want you to look at the beautiful words of Psalm 119, verse 160. When we talk about this book being everything we need, you can't find a better verse than Psalm 119, verse 160. The scripture says this. The psalmist said, The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. How much? The entirety. What's that mean? Every bit of God's word is truth. From Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22 verse 21, every bit of that is absolute truth from heaven on high and is what man needs to save his soul. Well, then let's think about another question. If this book contains all truth, how am I going to get that truth? I know it's there, but is it just somehow going to fill my life? Is it going to go through the process of osmosis? Somehow God's Word's just going to absorb into my life? Well, of course not. I've got to study to know the truth. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, the scripture says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If this book is all truth, friends, that ought to encourage us. It ought to motivate us. I want to study this book. I want to know it, and I want to live my life by it. I can't help but think of the people in Thessalonica. These were the people who weren't as noble. They didn't give their lives as well to the Word of God. But then in contrast with them, in Acts 17 verse 11, of the Bereans, Paul said they were more noble in that they learned the Word of God with all readiness and they searched the Scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11. And thus we've got to be ready always. We've got to study. We've got to give ourselves to a desire to know and do the will of God. But as we think about the great question, is there any word from the Lord? We can know the word. We can know what it is. We can know how to get it. But let's talk for just a minute about some specifics. Let's think specifically about the question, is there any word from the Lord on salvation? What must I do to be saved? The great question of Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31. It was asked in Acts chapter 2, when the Jews realized they had killed their own Messiah, they were cut to the heart and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Acts 2, verse 37. Is there any word from God on my salvation and on yours. Friend, the good news is God has made salvation available. Romans 1.16, the gospel, this, this book, the message of Jesus Christ is God's power unto salvation. James 1 verse 21, James said, if you receive with meekness the implanted word, it's able to save your souls. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. Well, if the Bible is God's message of salvation, what does it teach us 
a person must do to be saved. Friend, I want you to stop for just a moment and think about your own salvation. What did you do to be saved? Where were you? Uh, how old were you? What steps did you take by which you knew you had obeyed the plan of salvation and you were saved? Now, I want you to think about that and then let's examine for just a moment what the Bible says a person must do to be saved. First, the scriptures teach you must hear the word of God. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That, that truth that sets us free to initially be saved, I've got to listen to it. I can't help but think of the words of Mark chapter 9. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on that high mountain. He's there transfigured before them. He begins to shine. They're, they're in a state of awe and reverence. And in that context, Peter, because he's afraid, he doesn't know what to do, he blurts out, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Do you remember what God said? God's voice came from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son, hear Him. If I'm going to be saved, I must hear the Word of God. Now, I know hearing is essential, for the Bible says without faith I can't be saved. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says without faith it's impossible to please God. It's impossible. There's no way to please God without faith. Well, if it's impossible to please God without faith, then whatever process by which I get faith is also essential. Think again about Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If we're going to be saved, we've got to put aside prejudice. We've got to put aside bias. We've got to put aside what other people have told us. And we have got to give ear to the Word of God only and do what it says. And so what must I do to be saved first? You've got to hear the Word of God. Secondly, you must believe in Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do you remember Acts chapter 8? Philip is teaching the Ethiopian eunuch the gospel. He's got up in the chariot with him. They're traveling down the road. In the process of teaching him from Isaiah 53 about the Messiah being Jesus, in the distance they see water. And this man, he's excited. He's heard the message. He's ready to do what God says. And as he sees that water, he says, here's water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Do you remember the hindrance? Acts 8 verses 36 and 37. If you believe with all your heart, you may. To be saved, a person must believe Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus said in John 8, 24, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. But friend, be sure of this. It doesn't stop there. Salvation does not occur in the New Testament at the point of belief alone. If so, there'd been no need for Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch to get down out of the chariot. He'd have said right there, you're saved if you believe. But such was not the case. A person must also repent. You've got to change your way of thinking and change your way of living. Listen to Jesus' words in Luke chapter 13. Certain people came to Jesus and it looks like they're, they're there to tell on other people who have been living ungodly, who they think are acts of God's justice. There's these people who had their blood mingled with their sacrifice, meaning at the time of sacrifice, they killed those people. Their blood was mixed with the blood of the animals. And they say to Jesus, Weren't they worse sinners than all else because that happened? Well, Lord, what about these 18 people who are walking down the road, aimlessly minding their own business, and this tower comes from nowhere and crushes them? Wasn't that your justice on those evil, ungodly people? And do you know what Jesus said in verse 3 and verse 5? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Repentance is essential to salvation. Acts 3 verse 19, Peter preached, repent and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And so I hear God's word. I'm willing to believe. I'm willing to repent, change my life, and turn to God. Then I must make that good confession. 
Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. If you will confess me before men, I will also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. Making that confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, Acts 8, verse 36 and 37, is essential to salvation. In fact, in Romans chapter 10, verse 10, Paul said, with the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness, and listen, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Have we publicly, orally acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Both Jesus and Paul said that was essential to salvation. But again, it doesn't stop there. If we stop there, we've stopped short of what God says a person must do to be saved. To be saved. A person must also be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, I want you to look at two passages with me that, that beyond a shadow of a doubt teach from God's Word truth that we must be baptized to be saved. The first is found in Mark 16, verse 16. I want you to look at the simplicity of what Jesus said here. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, did Jesus say the person who believes alone will be saved? No, but there's a lot of people in this world who teach that. Well, did Jesus say the person who is baptized prior to belief will be saved? No, but every baby that's been sprinkled has gone through that process. What does Jesus say? Here's what he did say. He who believes and is baptized, what? And is baptized, will be saved. Friends, so many people get caught up in the doctrines of men. All you've got to do to be saved is believe. You know, the only time faith only occurs in the Bible, it's found in James 2.24, and God says, man is justified by works and not by faith only. It's not by belief alone. It's not by baptism alone. You can't just run out to the street, grab some fellow who's never heard about Jesus, dunk him in a pool of water, and he'll be okay. You've got to believe and be baptized to be saved. Although baptism is not the only step in God's plan of salvation, God does say it's essential to salvation. Well, someone says, well, that's Mark 16, 16. Are there any other passages? Absolutely there is. Look in Acts chapter 2, and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse 38. On that great day of Pentecost, Peter said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Did Peter preach when those Jews cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We realize our hands are dirty with the blood of the Messiah whom we killed. What do we need to do to be saved? Peter said you need to repent and be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. Now, someone says, well, what does for mean? For doesn't mean because of. And I know that when we look at how that language is used in the Bible. Think about Matthew 26, verse 28. As Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, he took that fruit of the vine and he said this, This is my blood of the new covenant, which was shed for many for the remission of sins. Well, what does for mean there? Did Jesus shed his blood because sins had already been remitted? No, exact same language in the Greek syntax. There it means in order to receive and the same is true in Acts 2.38. Well, someone says, well, I don't know if that's really what God's saying. Friend, that's not the only passage it occurs in. Think about Acts 22.16. When Ananias came to Saul, God had told Saul, you go in the city, be told you what you must do. Acts 9, verses 4 through 6. When God comes to Saul in the messenger of Ananias, Ananias says, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and listen, and wash away your sins, calling. On the name of the Lord. First Peter 3 and verse 21, Peter said, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, I want you to listen real carefully. If God says explicitly and in his own words, Baptism does now save us, how dare any man say baptism's not essential? Well, someone says, Are you saying I've got to be baptized to go to heaven? 
Friend, that's the exact language of Jesus. In John 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. A person cannot be saved, cannot get to heaven, and cannot be in a relationship with God outside of obeying what he says in the waters of baptism. Now someone says, well that sounds like you're saying that I earn my salvation, that baptism is some magical or mystical work. No, that's not what we're saying. We don't believe there's anything magical or mystical in the water. We don't believe that we're earning our salvation, but we do believe it is in obedience to the commands of God. Here's how Peter describes it. Peter said baptism is the answer of a good conscience. 1 Peter 3.21 When God says you must be baptized to be saved, Mark 16.16, 16, I respond with a good conscience by doing what God says and obeying His will. And so we don't, we don't believe we earn our salvation even at the point of baptism. Salvation is available by the grace of God and thus it is grace and faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 that Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. I must do what God says to obey God, to receive the free gift of salvation. I want you to think about this. As we conclude these matters today, I want you to think about the words of John 14 verse 15. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments. Friend, the fact is, there is word from God. God has spoken. That message tells us exactly what we must do to be saved. And the question lies with each one of us. Do we really love God enough to obey His will? Do you love God enough today to put aside maybe what you've always believed? Put aside what others have told you and just search the scriptures for yourself? Friend, if you've never obeyed the gospel, we are urging you today, in view of the fact that God has spoken, that message is clear, and one day I'll be judged by it. Won't you obey the gospel? Won't you become a Christian? God has spoken. That message is a message of hope and love. And today we urge you, become a child of God. Obey the gospel. Submit to God in baptism and rise out of that to live a new life. As we think about these matters, the truth is God has spoken and that message is a message of hope for me and you. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111.